Hey, welcome to another episode of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. Today we are combining forces with a podcast called What's New in Adapted Physical Education uh, by Scott McNamara. Uh, and this is going to be uh, broadcast on both platforms, on our podcast and theirs. Um, and basically, this is a part one and part two. So what you're getting here is part one. Uh, part two will launch next week. So we just wanted to kind of give a little understanding of how we're uh, kind of trying to break down these silos a little bit. So hopefully you enjoy getting a little bit of a different aspect, uh, a little bit more of a uh, informal podcast where we have a, um, a group of four different individuals on there kind of discussing topics. So uh, here we go in another episode of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. Can we get started? Uh, how do we start this? Like with the two, like we're doing the club. Well, I, I say we just start it. I mean, right, let's do it. You, you and I, Scott, we, we talked several times uh, over the phone in the last couple months. And, you know, one of our conversations has been, you know, you're an APE, I'm in PE, but both of them have the word physical education in there. And APE talks about inclusion. And I think my question and I think the impetus to kind of get a couple different people on this podcast was, I don't understand when the fields split and I don't know why there is a split, kind of like two silos. I think there is some overlap for sure. And, you know, there's journals that publish APE research that are traditionally aligned with, you know, they're not specific APE journals, but I just wanted to kind of get some people on at the same time and you know, you brought up a good idea of doing uh, basically a side-by-side -side podcast on both of our podcasts to kind of break down the silos. So um, why don't we just do some quick introductions uh, and then we'll um, just get in some questions. So why don't you start, Scott? Yeah, I'm Scott McNamara from the University of Northern Iowa and I run the What's New in Adapted Physical Education podcast, so I'm sure my listeners will also want to know a little bit about you, Risto. I do research on podcasting, adapted physical education, uh, some stuff in visual impairments, and yeah, I'm just uh, also super happy to be here to collaborate and kind of do this exciting new venture. Awesome. Uh, so Risto Martin and George Mason University. Um, I am in my first year at George Mason. I was at Kelsey Fullerton for three years before that. Um, I mostly do research in after-school programs. We have a program called REACH, which is on the ground in Southern California. And we're expanding that and uh, do research on teaching and physical education as well as attitude. Uh, and we just started with uh, Kevin, Aaron, Santeo, uh, Dylan Landy, and Sarah Flory, our podcast, which is research on teaching, uh, playing with uh, research in health and physical education. So um, we're just happy to, um, have a little collaboration. So why don't we go to, uh, Terry? Uh, Terry Rizzo. I'm at California State University, San Bernardino. I've been here for, about, <laughs> I feel ancient, 31 years. Um, I don't, when I left Illinois with my PhD, I was up at Cortland, SUNY Cortland. From there, I came out here. The reason why I mentioned that is because, um, when I look at the fields that we're discussing here and the research uh, and the uh, issue of silos uh, and um, how it seems like we're getting together, when did we split? Actually, um, we weren't really together in the 60s. Um, it was some funding through, at the time it was called Bureau of Education for a Handicap that started things going and then things evolved over different things occurred. And um, we actually had, we were fragmented. Um, I remember writing a paper when I was out here, oh, in the early, eight, late 80s, early 90s, from the back of the physical education bus, because as an adapted physical educator among my colleagues, I, I didn't think we were part of the group, if you will. Ironically, I wasn't from one of the traditional adapted physical education programs. As I mentioned uh, to Kevin earlier, uh, I was from the University of Illinois. We didn't have, a, if you will, a CAN program in Adapted PE. You were responsible for developing your own program based upon your line of inquiry and what research interests you had and the people over at Illinois had. Um, so when I look at this issue in this conversation, I, I, my frame of reference is a little bit different, but you are all exactly right. Things are changing 
And with that, I'll stop so Kevin could say hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Kevin Richards. I'm a, 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 I'm in my first year here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, before that, I was at the University of Alabama for three years in Tuscaloosa. Um, and then uh, I did my PhD work at Purdue University, and that's actually where I, I started to kind of cross over a little bit into uh even though that isn't really my my I was trained and adapted you know I, I kind of took that one class that many of us take during um, uh, an initial teacher education course in PE uh, on adapted and I got to Purdue and over the summer they asked me to do uh, an adapted physical education course for our university students that involved the field experience so I had to create that field experience and we did um a physical activity and aquatics program uh, for children with disabilities and I've always kind of been a little bit interested uh, in that um, and more recently I've done some work with uh, Wes Wilson and uh, Justin Hagel looking at how uh, adapted physical education teachers are socialized into their work roles uh, drawing from occupational socialization theory which is kind of my home base. All right, so so from there, um, real quick too, from one of Terry's points about programs, CAN programs, um, there's not too many CAN programs that are made for people that are APE areas, but like where I'm from, Texas Women's University, that's one of those areas where, you know, I like basically everyone that goes in there is a APE uh, specialist. And I think, uh, Rissa, you, you recently had one where you talked a little bit about like with Justin Hagel, about all those different types of programs that are out there. There are not that many, but there's a few of us. And yes, we are very siloed. So, you know, um, from my perspective, like, you know, I think p physical education, uh, you know, professionals a lot of times feel excluded within education in general. Um, I think being an APE in that field, we even feel excluded well, within the PE let, world. Let, let's uh, fast so forward to excluded current issues in today and what's happening in pedagogy uh, across the United States and community. program um, with and lower so, enrollment you know, facing I know extinction, we, uh, Terry especially when talking a little bit about some people are not, of how uh, this came to be. if somebody retires you know, and, and the position is not filled with the same kind of talent person. Maybe you can expand a little bit more on that and it's a good thing that we're separate. So if you're a pedagogy person and they uh, retire, they might hire an exercise scientist. What we're doing now, and, and it's interesting because the break, the differences, um, San Jose State and uh, us here at San Bernardino, we're trying something that was uh, discussed in the um, late 70s, early 80s, uh, called Infusion where we're taking the program of courses in adapted physical education credential and building it into the pedagogy credential so that people who are traditionally physical education teachers will take the coursework that we have for people with disabling conditions, uh, even though they may not become uh, adapted physical education teachers in the uh, public school, they may not go into the credential, they will have the coursework, which would include assessment of kids with disabilities, helping them assess motor behavior in the general PE class. They'll take a course in uh, understanding medical, different medical conditions under law. They'll take a behavior modification class, if you will, applied behavioral analysis. And if you think about public school teachers and the problems they have with the uh, class management, uh, it's a wonder that this hasn't been in the program long ago. And then we have a seminar built into it. And once those courses are completed, people would go into a, um, a credential program to get more specialized training, but at least all of our students starting in fall of 2020 will have that inclusive bit of experience. That's a model that was discussed in like 1979, 1980 um, with some people who were involved with something called inclusion. So we're coming full circle on something. And um, it's a really good thing uh, because pedagogy and adapted, it's a two group theory, right? Two group model non-disabled kids, kids with disabilities. And yet with inclusion, as you all know, 90% um, of kids, according to GAO report in 210, 90% of the kids 
uh, with disabilities are now now appearing in the general physical education class. And um, 88% are in middle school and high school. So in elementary school, you got 90% of the children with disabilities are there. So you better learn how to teach them. That's a very different world from the 1980s when all this stuff started. Uh, and well, the mid 70s, 1980s, when this started from the Bureau of Education with the, for the handicapped back in those days. So it's been an evolution. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but how how many classes are your, it, by fall 2020, how many classes are your students at San Bernardino taking in adapted physical education related classes? Or how many units? Yeah, there will be four three unit classes, semester unit classes. How do you fit that into the program? Well, uh, we what we did was because we're uh, a credential program through the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, uh, we restructured our program, and there was some fluff, to be honest with you. But when we and here's the interesting thing, we were migrating from quarters to semesters. We're one of five CSUs, and when we did, we transformed our curriculum. The other thing that we did, because in kinesiology we have basically three components: uh, allied health. Uh, exercise science and pedagogy, but the core number of classes we have, everybody has to take. One of the core classes we're requiring students to take is about adapted physical activity, not adapted physical education. And then from there, the kids, students in pedagogy follow the pedagogy model and we revise that. And what we did basically was short it up. We um, kind of, I, I hate to say, well, it's the truth. We got rid of stuff that was fluffy and we made it more parsimonious. It's a tighter model that we have today. And if you think about it though, uh, let's say you have a class on assessment right now in your pedagogy program. Well, <laughs> uh, that's fundamental to what we do in adapted physical education. So now in that assessment class, you're going to have to be more thorough in your academic preparation of students and beyond the fitness gram, or you'll be, you'll be teaching about um, tests that we use for kids with disabling conditions, and you're getting a, a more uh, highly qualified physical educator with this model. So we literally change things around in our undergraduate degree program. Do you feel like there's things now that your general PT, uh, you know, your pre-service general PE teachers are not getting, um, you know, because you've added all these things unadapted? Yes, but if you think about it, we really didn't add much. The assessment class we had, we're just making it more uh, cleaner and tighter and more efficient, and we're maximizing uh, our efficiency there. The course about the nature of disabilities and its implications to teaching, um, walk that back for a second. Uh, if you look and consider the data, if you've got 90% of kids with disabilities in the general PE class, and I'm not necessarily referring to severe and profound, I'm talking about kids with everything from asthma and learning disabilities, right? So why not make, if you shore that class up and then you teach about the kind of kids you're going to be exposed to, now you're a little bit more prepared to handle what you're going to deal with. That's an addition. The other addition is applied behavior management. But that's a significant addition that I, I think we all would agree, managing behavior, student behavior this, these days in public schools is fundamental to uh, success in teaching. The other class, the seminar, we already had that in there. We're just going to make that a little tighter. So it's taking what you already have and maybe adding something, one or two things, and getting rid of some fat. How about in terms of uh, faculty expertise? Because that, that's one thing that, that I would be concerned about uh, at a lot of different programs that I've been associated with over the years uh, is that frankly, we just don't have uh, faculty who, who, are, uh, who have adapted backgrounds. Right, uh, and that's a really good point. <laughs> when I was chair of the department, um, we started doing infusion uh, 20 years ago. And everybody said the same thing to me, exercise physiologist, biomechanist, whatever. <laughs> I would say to them, all right, what are you going to do in your lab? And it doesn't matter if a person comes with a cardiovascular disease, you name it, or they come into your lab setting with um, epilepsy and you don't know it, or diabetes. I mean, these are all conditions that we deal with on a daily basis. So it's asking people to think differently about what it is they're teaching. 
And if it means some shoring up of some skills, well, then that's what it means. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be teaching kids in public schools, don't look any further than a GAO report in 2010. They're there. Not to prepare them uh, uh, properly. That's tantamount to negligence. So you got to shore up your skills. I mean, that, it just it's business. And when you're hiring new faculty people, I would say I would look for people who are, if they don't have the proper preparation, are you willing to work with us? Because that's just, it's that critical. Yeah. What are, what are your, uh, now my background is very unique uh, because my bachelor's is in special education. I then got my master's in adaptive physical education. So my background is like with people with disabilities to the extreme, like that's all I've, my education's ever really been. And, and also for some context, Terry is in California, and in my perspective, California is one of the most um, proactive states in kind of like making APE a part of their, their everyone's education. Every school district is going to have APE teachers, and as we probably know, that's not everywhere. Um, so kind of like what's your general background um, in a general PE uh, program? How much, how much discussion is happening um, in your experiences, in your programs, in your past experiences with APE? You know, in some, uh, you know, in some environments that I was in, uh, I'm not sure it's still, if it's still like this, but at the time, um, in the state of Indiana, when I was there at Purdue doing my, uh, my, my graduate work, uh, the state certified PE and APE together. And so essentially what that meant was that students took one kind of, uh, one class on adapted adapted physical education that uh, had to have a field experience component, and then the idea was that um, uh, working with students with disabilities was going to be kind of infused throughout the rest of the program beyond that one class. Now, the extent to which that happened is a whole different conversation. Um, the uh, it, but in other places, uh, you know, and I was in Alabama for three years, but. It, from what I saw, the discipline of adapted physical education does not exist in the state of Alabama. This is Terry. Uh, that doesn't, none of that surprises me. What I didn't mention as well is in addition to those four classes, uh, everyone's going to take an, a, a, an introduction to adapted PE in the pedagogy program. So in a way they take five classes. Um, and when you talk to people throughout the country, and it's more of the norm that they take, if they take one class, that's a lot. Go back and read that GAO report. The criticisms that they had was, well, most physical education teachers in public schools are saying, you know, I'm really not prepared to deal with what I'm dealing with because I only had one class. Some didn't have any. So indeed, one class is not enough. One class does not make a, an adaptive physical educator any more than really uh, saying that uh, Target's a restaurant because they sell pizzas. I mean, really, uh, forget it. It doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> so, that was good. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think it's the I same mean, thing if you look at, you know, how we talk about infusing social justice into programs. We talk about who has one course. And it's not about having that one course when you learn about right. social justice issues and gender and you know, race, and then if it's not infused throughout the program, I, I will say the two universities that I've been at in in university positions, both of those university position, places had only one APE course. And I would say that the vast majority of the students that I've had interactions with talking about adapted PE, they don't feel prepared. And And how should they if you have... 16 weeks in a semester, one's, you know, an introduction kind of, this is the class, there's a couple weeks when you're doing some assessment for that course, you're left with, you know, 12 weeks of solid content and learning how to do something that another person has spent their career learning to do. It's the same thing as California allowing generalist uh, elementary school teachers to teach physical education. We give them a three year oh, yeah. class and they take a class or they take a test and pass the test because they're good students and they want to be teachers. And now they're in charge of teaching PE. Yeah. And, and uh, Scott, you made this point a few minutes ago, I think, um, 
but uh, in some of the research that that I did with Wes Wilson, um, we, uh, we we did a, a year long project looking at the experiences of um, uh, pre service adapted physical education teachers uh, in, in a teacher education program that was very much field based. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that that we identified through that work was that the the uh, adapted PE teachers felt extremely marginalized uh, and, and not only marginalized by the school structures and the itinerant nature of their work, but they felt marginalized by the physical education teachers with whom they were working. And so you have this situation where the where like the marginalized are marginalizing the more marginal. Yeah, and you know, uh, and Terry can probably you know uh, add to this, but to me, I'm all I, so this year. I didn't go to Shape America because I went to the uh, Council for Exceptional Children, which is a special education right. conference, and I did that. I wanted to try out a special ed conference because, as an APE teacher, uh, we're never really sure if we're uh, more housed in PE or for more housed in special education, um, and you know, and we're always kind of not sure which way to go. Um, yep, I went yep. to the special ed conference and no offense to the special ed conference, but uh, I didn't, I felt uh, marginalized again. Um, I didn't feel like my voice was heard again. So I think I'm going to come back to shape. Um, well, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, you know, I have a, I have a colleague who, who's written about uh, kind of how physical education serves multiple different masters. So it kind of sits at the intersection of, of sport education and health. And I think for adapted, you could add a fourth dimension to that and say that adapted also um, kind of serves uh, th th this, this special education focus as well that, that might be independent from those other three. Bringing that up is when you think about, when you think about like conferences um, in the way that our professional organizations are constructed, when, when, Shape, when AFERD at the time reorganized the Shape America, I, I, I was concerned because I didn't feel like there was a very clear, identifiable space for, for adapted physical education. And I raised that point, I raised that concern at one point. Um, and, and, you know, so Shape America has now four program councils. It's physical activity, physical education, health, and um, shoot, there's one, uh, research. And then they also just added a professional preparation council. So there are five, there are five councils. And, and I and I raised that concern. I said, "Well, where does adapted physical education fit within that five council structure?" And the response that I got was that it was kind of supposed to be sprinkled throughout. So on each of those councils, you had somebody with an adapted background, but the voices on those councils are very dominantly um, geared towards you know whatever the primary uh, title of the council is. So on the physical education council, you've got one APE person. On the teacher prep council, you've got one APE person. So it, it feels a little bit like tokenism to me. Actually, this, Terry, uh, actually, you all are right. Um, and in fact, feeling marginalized, Walt Davis and I wrote about this from when uh, I wrote a paper in the 90s about uh, being at the back of the bus. Uh, I took issues at the time. Research Quarterly used to have a um, a special population segment in there. They took it out. They said, well, you're mainstreaming everybody now. So your research should be built into that, more like an inclusion model. And then fast forward to today in public schools, when you talk about being marginalized there, our teachers are adapted people. Well, parents go to IEP meetings. They want to know about OTPT, speech pathology, adapted PEs and afterthought. Yet we're the only ones required by law in, as part of special ed. The general physical educators, they look, they look at us going like, uh, we're not interested because if, if we do any good teaching of physical education, we're going to be more concerned about coaching, that teacher-coach conflict. And um, then you have elementary schools where we don't always have, as you mentioned, uh, physical education teachers teaching elementary PE. We have classroom teachers. So we're in a mess <laughs> in a lot of ways. And then when Shape, when uh, Apron broke up, a lot of us were at the meetings and we felt the same way as you're saying right now. Where are we? Um, and yet, here's the irony of this. I mentioned this earlier. When you start looking at programs being eliminated at universities, whether you talk about Purdue or in Georgia, it, you know, you start thinking, uh, this is not a good thing. What's one way of turning that around? Well, 
we know, at least in California, there are jobs in adapted, and the and the silver tsunami is going to hit, and it's and it's occurring. Uh, a lot of retirements from baby boomers. So why not prepare really good physical education teachers, and if you can, in my mind, get away from that sport driven curriculum and get down to a physical activity model where you're teaching lifetime pursuits as we had always hoped in adapted PE. And then when you do that and you prepare your people better and they get jobs with this new model, you can increase enrollments, keep your survival in the university program. And then it's kind of like a everybody wins situation. That's what we're trying to do here. That's what we're doing in San Jose. And that's what's, and if you look at the enrollment patterns at both places in pedagogy, they're increasing. Kids find out they're more marketable. They feel better prepared. They feel good. Now, do we need some hard data on this? Yeah, of course. But right now, um, we're just doing the practical things to make it go. But that marginalization in silos, that's been around for a long time. And it's really bad. It's really unfortunate. I got a question, Terry. Now, this is a question of whether we should be separate entities. Um, a little bit because I think this is kind of so Claudine Cheryl has that famous saying Claudine Cheryl is one of our most famous researchers and pioneers in um, an APE and uh, she said all good physical education is adapted physical education that was one of her sayings I've heard that critiqued a few times uh, over the years as well because is that and, and kind of to your point Terry are we advocating that all PE teachers should go through programs where um, a, they feel comfortable teaching, um, you know, kids with disabilities, which I think we can all uh, appreciate. But do we also think that kids coming out of their PE programs, their general PE program, should be APE teachers, APE specialists? Is that something that should be one and the same? I don't know if you all know my relationship with Claudine. Uh, I mean, she's retired now and her health isn't the best, but uh, Claudine and I, we're on a, a same kind of wavelength when um, my attitude, my research is on attitude theory and change uh, out of Illinois, right? Um, yeah, I do actually. And, and, and my, uh, I do believe that uh, if you're going to be a good physical educator, you're going to have to be a good adaptive physical educator because I don't know what, what, what's, what's the government saying about where the kids are going. I mean, when you have 90% of kids with disabilities in your GPE classes, and, and mind you, inclusion is a problem for me because it's become wholesale dumping out here in California. It, it, and in many ways, it violates uh, the law in terms of uh, a least restrictive environment model. Um, so we have to deal with the, the complexity of school districts dumping kids with disabilities in a general physical education class without attending to the models that we talked about for um, inclusion. So for example, Lou Brown at Wisconsin in the early 80s said, if you're going to do, at the time it was called the Regular Education Initiative and other things, right? He said, if you're going to do this, principle of portability, principle of natural proportions. Most people don't even know what those are. And people who write about inclusion, they're going, uh, what? Look, <laughs> I, I'm not a biologist, but I'm sure as hell I'm not going to put Mountain Dew in my fish tank, right? If I'm going to have people out in physical education teaching kids in their classes, and we know 90% of them have disabilities. You know, they, 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 need, they need the preparation. And what's the leading cause of people leaving the profession the first five years? Management problems. I mean, it's spell it out. I mean, we prepare, and when Claudine said that, she was spot on. That's why she's the soul of adapted PE. She had it right. She had it right. I'd leave you without a closure. I would never do that to you. Part two is coming towards you next week, same time. Um, so hope you enjoyed this. We'll show you another uh, uh, episode next week.